On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in collaboration with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN Chief Medical Correspondent and Associate Chief of Neurosurgery at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Uh, Sanjay, it's, it's just really a pleasure, it's a privilege uh, to have you with us today. Um, on behalf of all of us in healthcare, the public, uh, who are, you know, all of us that are fighting COVID-19 out there, and our 36,000 members globally, um, thanks for your tireless efforts in reporting and, and for joining us. Um, you know, the American that Academy of Neurology- Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, the American Academy of Neurology, um, you know, we can get along, neurologists, neurosurgeons, perfect. Even in a pandemic, we, we can get along. Um, you've, you've been um, on the front lines of so many different disasters, you know, from mm. the catastrophe, the earthquake in Haiti. I think you actually jumped into action <laughs> you had to operate um, once yeah. uh, when you were there. Um, you've seen SARS. You've reported on so much in the last several decades. Um, you know, this is forcing neurologists to just you know, think about things differently, practice out of their comfort zone. Um, you know, what, what are you, how does this compare? How does this, uh, this pandemic with COVID-19 compare to other catastrophes? And, and maybe what, do you, what advice do you have from a gestalt perspective about, you know, how this is going to affect neurologists? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it's interesting. I, I think with a lot of other uh, situations like Haiti or natural disasters, even conflicts, uh, there is a there is a uh, a sort of built in timeline a little bit even if it's not totally uh, you know firm you sort of have some idea of how long something's going to last or how long you're going to be involved with it with this uh, you know uh, pandemic it, it's we really have no idea and and truly you know you're sort of living it at the same time that you're reporting on it as are you and probably a lot of people who are who are um, you know watching right now? You, you're you're taking care of patients and living through this at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really different in that regard. I have covered you know I covered H1N1, which was the last pandemic, but it became pretty clear um, you know fairly early on that it, it wasn't going to be nearly as lethal as even seasonal flu at that point. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one you know as soon as we started seeing some of those reports out of China, uh, early you know sort of second week of December timeframe there was already a lot of concern uh, among certainly public health community, but also the, the medical journalists who, who covered these sorts of stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I think that from, from a Gestalt standpoint, obviously there's so much that we're, we're still learning about this. Uh, you know, we, there was a paper just published in, uh, I think, Gastroenterology this past week uh, talking about uh, a whole new sort of subset of symptoms, which ended up being a lot more common than people realize. That is to say that 50% of these patients are, are presenting actually with GI symptom. Um, that wasn't even in the initial 42,000 person paper. It was all fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Yep. And now we hear that loss of appetite is occurring in 84% of the 50% that are presenting with this diarrhea, abdominal pain, and vomiting. So these are all sort of new things. Um, but I, but I don't, you know, so I, I don't know, I guess, uh, what the gestalt is for neurologists right now. Uh, we're, you know, there's, there's new data coming out all the time. I think one of the big points, though, and, and maybe, you know, you've sort of fundamentally understood this, but when you look at these death rates around the world and really kind of get granular on them, Hubei death rate was around 2.3%, the province of Hubei in, in, in uh, East, uh, central China. Um, Outside of Hubei was, you know, 0.8 to 1%. And, and Hubei is, you know, a fairly sophisticated province, not, you know, it's uneven through the province, but really good hospitals there. So you ask, why is that, right? And, and as you may immediately infer, it really had everything to do with the strain on the medical system. Mm -hmm. So the, where, where you're seeing significant strain on the medical system, that's really what's driving these fatality rates, I think, much higher. There's other things, elderly population in Northern Italy, big smoking population, uh, both in China and in, and in Italy. But I think the strain on the medical system is the, the biggest thing that, um, you know, we're talking about more so than testing, which I think has become a little bit of a false metric here. Yeah, so um, yeah. that that's the gestalt, I guess, in terms of just from a health, more, more from a practitioner standpoint. Yeah, you know, I'm located in Wild Cornell Medicine in New York Presbyterian in New York City, and you know, we've yeah. become the epicenter. Um, I, um, you know, I'm 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 so um, you know proud of of our hospital. I'm proud of our 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 students, our residents, our neurology residents being redeployed literally as we speak. Um, all of our faculty, neurology faculty, we're we're going to get reassigned, whether it's to the emergency room, you know, doing whatever we need to do, uh, whether it's to be inpatient consults. You know, some of us are going to join the internal medicine teams, and some of us, you know, maybe if you did an internship in surgery for for some, they're going to 
potentially do surgery. So we're, we're, we're jumping in. Um, and I think, you know, neurologists, um, you know, we're, we're seeing things, you know, we had uh, just this weekend, we admitted two patients with myasthenia gravis in their thirties, two, two young mm-hmm. men with myasthenia gravis who are, you know, COVID positive. And wow, what do we do? Do we use hydroxychloroquine? Wait, well, that worsened their myasthenia, but, yeah. but we need to get them to live. So maybe we can manage the myasthenia another way. There's so many idiosyncratic things. I, I think you reported just the other day about anosmia, um, lack of yeah. smell as a presenting symptom. Um, maybe tell me a bit about that. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, and, and, and just on the previous point as well, Doc, you know, the, the, um, with those patients, for example, with the myasthenia gravis, yeah. I, I imagine that that was more, uh, more acutely the problem. Um, I mean, you know, in, in, there is a significant per, uh, percentage of the population that is 20 to 44 that is being hospitalized. But for the most part, yeah. the, the really severe illness is in the elderly. Yeah. So just, out of, you know, with the myasthenia gravis patients, did you end up treating them? Uh, for their yeah, well, we, we needed to stabilize them first, um, and that was that was the key. Yeah. You know, we have them on oxygen. We we had a, a, a tricky sick, decision yeah. about hydroxychloroquine, and, and the, the data is honestly not really that solid. But when you have a crashing person in their 30s that's hospitalized, um, yeah. it's it's you know these are these are tough questions, and you know we decided maybe maybe we shouldn't use it because it could worsen the myasthenia. But these are questions that neurologists just haven't you know ever even thought about. You know, we have patients with multiple sclerosis who are at higher risk. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we have also patients maybe. Um, who are not presenting with neurologic complaints, but patients who are normal when they come in and they present with neurological complaints, possibly due to coronavirus. So, you know, we talked about the symptom anosmia um, that, that was recently reported. And, and, you know, there was a report, it's not been peer reviewed yet, but it came out about a month ago from China that about a third of coronavirus patients had some type of neurological symptom, whether it's yeah. altered consciousness or skeletal muscle damage or acute cerebrovascular disease. And that was much more common in severe cases. And this is something we've never seen before. For. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I, it's, it's forced a, a, a sincere humility, you know, because uh, every day, you know, well, not every day, but very often there's, there's, there's new uh, data that's sort of coming out about this. The anosmia thing, there was actually a, a um, uh, sort of small case series that came out uh, of China. Um, I think it was in, in January but it was pretty tiny and it was, it was hard to sort of um, um, disentangle it from the other symptoms the patients were having. But now it's become clear that patients can present with um, anosmia as a, as a sole presenting symptom, uh, aside from congestion, aside from runny nose, anything like that. And, um, and then those patients, you know, they're, they're getting the idea that if they're going to progress to hospitalization, most don't, um, 85, 84 or so percent of the patients in that study did not progress to hospitalization, but the ones who did usually progress around nine days. So That's that right. gives you a little bit of an idea of the course of this. So, and, and, and one thing just about the hydro, um, the, the uh, hydroxychloroquine slash uh, azithromycin uh, right. treatment, which I think you were referencing, uh, you, you know, it's really interesting, and this was something that I, I, I think was important, again, um, this sort of inflection point between, um, between medicine and, and uh, the communication of, of these topics. So that was a 26-person study, non-randomized, non-blinded in yeah. France. And yeah. um, uh, when they reported the data, there was 20 patients that were reported in the data. Uh, yeah. Six patients were excluded. And I just bring this up because I think it's important and, and one of those real challenges, I think, as a medical reporter. But those six patients, we were really curious, who, you know, what happened to the six patients? They weren't part of the final treatment group. Well, it turns out that one left the hospital just on their own, did not want to participate. One, one could not tolerate the therapy, the side effects. Uh, so uh, just um, uh, sort of withdrew for that reason. Three went to the intensive care unit and one died. So, you know, very, very small study. But if you were to do the math on that and, yeah. and have any, make anything of it at all, mm-hmm. those mortality and morbidity rates are higher than the general infected population. Yep. So, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, it's like we were talking about. I think it's great to be hopeful, but, you know, we wanted to make sure that people understood that a, a non randomized, non blinded trial. Yeah. The reason it's limited is for this. Here's what you right. didn't see as part of all that. And that's and they were already selecting patients they thought were going to, you know, 
who want to actually respond. So yeah, and, I, and I, I admire your skill and your um, thoughtfulness in addressing a topic like this, because, you know, when, when medical world and, and, and the political world and, and, and other interests are, are intermixed, I, I stay apolitical, yeah. but I want us yeah. to be really careful about medical communication. Um, and, yeah. you know, who's the, the one person can say one message and, um, you know, things can get really misinterpreted. I just read about yesterday about someone took uh, some chloroquine, which is from a, 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 an aquatic, from his, you know, t- yeah. t- t- for fish tank or something and and the, the guy passed away and, and then his wife is in the ICU so that's not the right chloroquine it's not the right drug um, so these not are bad. these are really dangerous things uh, to talk about yeah I mean you know I think um, uh, it's it's probably the real real uh, sort of thing that doctors deal with all the time you know you want to be hopeful yeah. uh, um, you balance it with honesty honesty is obviously in lead position but I, I think there's a danger I think as you're saying to false hope it's not just I'm disappointed I mean people uh, like this man out of Arizona, he, you know, he, he died and his wife's in critical care unit in Arizona. So it's, yeah. it's pretty frightening. There's also now, you know, um, as, as you may know, uh, chloroquine is now on the official uh, global drug shortage list yeah. uh, just in, in the last week. And there yeah. are people who take it for different reasons, especially the hydroxychloroquine uh, chloroquine for, for autoimmune disease. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, there's all these ripple effects from those types of things. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, we just want to examine the evidence upon which this is based. Yeah. You know, we're learning a lot. We learned a lot from China. Um, yeah, I have a four month old at home, so I've been um, scouring the literature. Um, you know, yeah. uh, JAMA Neurology, Lancet has had a, a lot of great articles. Um, uh, Practical Preventative Medicine is a journal from China. It came out a, f- a few weeks ago about um, babies, basically infants mm. from one month to 11 months. It was the first case series. So I was obviously worried and, and wanted to read up. Um, you know, the, the evidence is exploding. And, you know, we're, we're learning, you know, more and more from the Italy experience, from the Spain experience. Um, you know, we have a, a, a partner that we're broadcasting this with, uh, Neurology Today. And it's mm. really a, a periodic, the news source for the American Academy of Neurology. And, and literally uh, today and, and, and tomorrow and, and every day going forward, we're publishing a uh, uh, stories about talking to, to doctors on the front line, Spanish neurologists. Um, we talked to the CDC neurologist the other day, and also right. uh, a story coming out now from the experience in France. You know, so our members are, are being updated. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the news and the information is coming so fast and so furious. Um, I guess just to close, um, man, you've been through a lot. You, you've seen a lot. You, you, you understand the data. Um, how bad is this? Um, I, I hate to say it, but um, um, you know, for, for a month, on February 18th is when I sounded the alarm. I actually sent a text message to a friend of mine and said, oh boy, uh, this, we're going to run out of hospital beds in a month. Uh, get your stock market money ready. You know, I'm, I'm terrible at money mm-hmm. management, but um, at the stock market's going to crash. It's going to be a mess. And, and, and you know, people without a medical background kind of said, ah, you're, you're over, over hyping things. Um, and, and then, you know, just even there's a, even a handful of doctors out there that may still not um, see it. You know, we're, 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 this is a catastrophe. I'm, 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 you know, the heroic efforts of, of our healthcare system, you know, we're, we're down to limited masks. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sharing one mask with my wife and I, because, you know, I haven't picked mine up yet. And, and that, that's kind of what, what we're doing. And we're doing that all over all over the country, um, but there there are probably pockets of physicians out there and practicing neurologists who you know may have cut back their practice and you know not not seeing sick patients and, and maybe doing more telemedicine, which is great. They've they've loosened yeah. the loosened the rules and and that's and that's great. But if there's a neurologist watching this and that just doesn't really believe or think mm-hmm. that this is something and oh this too shall pass and in a few weeks you know we'll stop the social distancing and go on with our lives. Um, how bad is this? Uh, where where do you think we're going to be in a few weeks and and where do you think this is going to end? Well, I, you know, I, I worry that in a few weeks, uh, the numbers are going to be much higher. You know, I think that part, part of that is just because, you know, if you look at the picture that we're getting right now, in some ways, you have to assume that that's a picture of the, of the, of the status of things, you know, up to two weeks ago, and, you know, that the, the, the sort of uh, time, the latency time between exposure to, to developing enough symptoms to go get tested, if you can get tested, you know, seven to 10 days, and, and then, you know, a couple of days for the test. So you're really getting a picture from 10 to 14 days ago. And you have to assume that over this period of time, the last 10 to 14 days, the virus has continued to spread. I, I think that um, uh, I think there is a best case and a and a um, medium case and a worst case sort of scenario. I mean, there is there is a, a, a very reasonable possibility, despite the fact that we can't say for sure that this has a seasonal variation to it, yeah. and that you know come uh, um, next month, really, because that's when SARS sort of peaked. We may see a similar sort of peaking here, and and as the weather is warm and the uh, the humidity goes up. 
for all the reasons that you get seasonal variation, um, you, you know, you might see some benefit there. Um, and, you know, the, the social distancing measures, if they continue to be implemented, which I think they probably will, at least for a couple more weeks, um, can be quite beneficial. I mean, you know, China and South Korea have sort of come through this now. I mean, there could be a second wave over there, but there was sort of an eight to 10 week curve, you know, sort of beginning to apex to, to sort of the, the tail end of that. And, and that, you know, I think we could go that way. I think the real challenge is, you know, Italy's really uh, become a, a, such a severe scenario because of the strain on the medical system. And we got to make sure that we are being able to deal with that. And there's some innovative sort of things happening. Governor Cuomo and I spoke today and he's yeah. talking about the fact, well, maybe this makes total sense to you. I hadn't really thought of it myself, to be honest, was yeah. they're dealing with it first now where you are there's 20,000 ventilators sitting in stockpile. They're going to make some more. They sent, I think, another 2,000. You may have them for a period of time, and then the ventilators move, you yeah. know, to another location. We yeah. tend to think of, you know, these things all being static in each state, but it may be a question of moving these commodities around. Yeah. The worst yeah. case scenario, though, just quickly, I'll say is that, yeah. you know, um, you know, you have something that's circulating that uh, if it has... Um, even, you know, half the lethality rate as it's, as we're seeing in Italy, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about, you know, a million people will die yeah. and many, many people will be hospitalized. Um, you know, again, young people do get hospitalized with this. It, it's not just a live or die sort of scenario for them. Yeah. So the initial um, data, you know, suggested, oh, if you're over 65, if, you know, three or three or more pre-existing conditions, okay, those are the susceptible folks. Now, now, granted, now, if you're younger than 50, I believe the statistic was only you know, less than 1% die. For survival, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. But, but how many people get hospitalized? I'm um, staying in the hospital. And, and, you know, something that I think, I just, I, I think you may have reported it, but I haven't heard this much, the persistent lung injury after this yes. infection i mean I, what if i'm not able to run like, like i used to what if what if people actually like can't take care of themselves the burden on the on the caregivers and healthcare system i mean do you have any information about the the lung the lung damage i yeah. mean that, that was worrisome to me yeah it was it was worrisome so what they so they they uh, define recovered in in china they define recovered uh, in different ways in, in different countries. Some define it as uh, absolute um, uh, negative tests, uh, um, uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, two, day, two tests in a row on al alternate days. So over okay. three days, two negative tests. Some define it as absence of symptoms. You know, some define it as one, app, one negative test or just no okay. clinical symptoms, all these different things. So it's a little bit of a hodgepodge in terms of how you define recovered. But in the recovered patients in this China study, um, what they found was that uh, there was about 30% of them that had some evidence of impaired lung function afterwards. 30%. And it, 30%, so about a oh. third. Now, some of it was pretty minor, you know, pretty minor lung. You, you, it was not noticeable except on their own pulmonary function test, but, yeah. but it got up to 20 to 30% diminished lung right. function. So significant shortness of breath, you know, walking a block where there wasn't that before. You know, people were, were describing uh, in, in this paper some of their, their limitations as a result of that. But, you know, we didn't find that out until, you know, these patients sort of went through the recovered and then were followed about four to six weeks out. Right. So we are seeing some longer lasting uh, issues with these patients. Wow, that is that is striking, and especially for patients with neurological disorders um, who are already compromised. Um, that, That's that right. That could take a... A really, really big toll. Um, so, Sanjay, I just, I just again on behalf of the, the entire American Academy of Neurology and Neurology Today, I just thank you so much. You're, uh, you know, helping to raise, raise. The sh you know, my, I've been saying this over and over. As a doctor, we need to be shouting from the rooftops yeah. that this is a serious condition, and we're, we're, we got to shout really loud. But, but, but you're, you're helping people, and you're getting them to listen. And, and I, I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, just, just to thank switch you. gears, maybe to a, a little bit of a happier topic. Um, as neurologists, um, I. I you're 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 invading our turf. You, you have a book coming out about brain <laughs> health and about uh, keeping yeah. the brain healthy using evidence-based interventions. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Um, I, I bet um, I bet it's I think it's coming out in June. Um, I yeah. heard, heard great things about it. Uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about it? Well, I mean, and, and I mean this in, in total sincerity, a, a lot of the reason that I was motivated to write the book was because of the sort of work that you do and you. and this and this belief that you know we we do have. 
uh, more control over our brains than we than we realize, and yeah. the, our brain health, and 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 what our brains can do in terms of warding off disease. You know, I I, I um, I'm interested in the brain. You know, I I, I fully granted that neurologists are, uh, know a lot more about some of these to- most of these topics, frankly, than I do. But I was really just an int- I was just very interested in the brain, and and I approached this sort of as a person with an interest in the brain who who had a little bit of a journalist sort of approach to it. I did want to ask some questions about wh- why do we have these notions of thinking of the brain as sort of this black box organ. You know, we, we don't think of the heart that way. We, the best that we get is, you know, what's good for the heart is also good for the brain. But how, how can we don't think of the brain in some sort of special way? Yeah. Uh, so demystifying a little bit, I think, for a lay audience. I also, you know, was really struck again by some of the work that you, you've been doing and the papers that I've read that you've written about, you know, this, this sort of um, this preclinical time. Uh, when it comes to things like Alzheimer's, you know, when you have um, evidence of, of of plaque in the brain, but uh, patients are, are, you know, asymptomatic. Um, what is to be made of that preclinical time? How do we define adequate treatment? Uh, is it important to actually have the you know, drugs that are targeting plaques, if we know that plaques are there in this preclinical time, and yet patients can be, you know, relatively symptom free. So, you know, how to explain that part to people, I think, was was another goal of the book. Um, and and, and then I think, hopefully, in a way that, that that inspires them to do things that are helpful for their brain health. You know, it's the what and the why. Uh, I think that always makes a better impression. And then finally, you know, I mean, I, everyone, I'm sure on this call and everybody who, who thinks about dementia overall knows that we haven't made a lot of progress with Alzheimer's, specifically in terms of therapeutics, aside from, you know, uh, a lot of the work that you're doing in terms of helping people reverse disease based on lifestyle choices. In terms of therapeutics, we haven't. And this sort of you know, correlated with the previous thing, why not? I mean, has, has the questions that everyone on this call has heard, you know, what has amyloid plaque gotten too much attention? Um, what about tau? But what about even more important, this preclinical time, you know? So that was the goal. And I, and I wanted to travel and, and, um, and also learn from some other cultures. I, I spent time in, in, in Guam, for example, where they have a really high incidence of Alzheimer's uh, ALS uh, um, uh, syndrome. So is there, are there lessons there? But that was, that was it, you know, and, and I really enjoyed it, um, you know, because I learned a lot and I'm applying some of these things to my own life and now making my kids, I have three teenage girls, I'm making them do some of the things I learned in the book. So it was great. It was, it was a useful experience. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm really excited. You know, um, you know, we, we can, we can hit the pavement and, 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 you know, put our heads down and do the research, but to, to really spread the research in a, in a way that the public understands in English um, and getting this message out there in a responsible, balanced way, you know, that just like you said, you know, you can grab the bull by the horns and, and people can take control of their brain health and reduce risk. Yeah. You know, we don't have a magic pill or a magic bullet, of course, but there are definitely things people can do. And most neurologists don't realize that there's 46 million Americans today that have, you know, the pathology of Alzheimer's beginning in their yeah. brain, but no symptoms, just like you said, right. preclinical or pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's. So appreciate yeah. you getting the message out there, giving people a, a, a helpful uh, but balanced roadmap. Well, uh, thank you. And, and, and again, sincerely, thank you for, for your work, because I think, I think um, it's very inspiring. Uh, like I said, I've already adopted a lot of it, and I think a lot of other people will as well. Sounds great. Well, Dr. Gupta, it's just been absolute pleasure. Much respect. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, get out there. You got some reporting to do. I have a, yeah. I have a feeling we'll be seeing you. Um, and just for those uh, those people watching, all of this information has been current as of March 24th uh, in the late afternoon. Um, we'll post this as soon as possible. Um, we plan on doing several of these briefings, um, honestly, um, as many as possible um, on a variety of topics. We're going to talk about wellness. Uh, that's an important topic. Uh, you taking care of yourself? Are you? not, not as well as I'd like, I'll be yeah. honest. I'm just not getting enough sleep, you know, working a 24 hour news cycle. And then, you know, so much of the news coming out of China, which is the other end of the clock. So, right. you know, we're just constantly, so not practicing what I preach now, but okay. uh, I'm well, hoping to make up for it. Let's, let's focus on that. That's uh, yeah, for brain health advice. and uh, I know. you haven't You're slept right, right. and fast forwards, the bad stuff. Uh, but we'll, we'll keep everyone uh, engaged. And if you have suggestions about what to cover, you can shoot me an email at rii9004 at med.cornell.edu. Sanjay, absolute pleasure. Namaste. Thanks, Thanks so sir. Much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Call anytime. Thank you. Sure. Bye-bye.